audible? Hello? Okay, so should we start? Okay, so as I said that one of the topics that we were to cover in uh, synchronization that was related to deadlock, I asked you to make presentations. So I'll go through these presentations and uh, the presentation that I find the best, I'll be using that as for my classroom. Or maybe I can combine the presentations of one or two students. It depends upon how good they are. So anyhow, so today we are going to cover, uh, but anyhow that class will be taken whenever I have extra time. So today we'll be starting with memory management. And uh, are my screens up, uh, uh, visible to you? Are the presentation slides visible to you? Yes. So uh, another thing is that I have posed the question for uh, attendance purpose. You can answer it uh, by 920 at your leisure. So let's start with uh, the class. So we said that operating system is a resource manager. And uh, as a resource manager, one of the resource that it needs to manage is memory. And this memory has to be divided into different, uh, divide, uh, should be shared uh, among different processes. But one process should not be allowed to access memory allotted to another process. So there should be an isolation. So memory virtualization means that we have to allot memory in such a man manner that more than one processes can make use of memory and they do not interfere with the memory allocated to other processes. So each process gets an illusion, uh, operating system creates an illusion that the entire memory is available to that process. So if you look at the memory system uh, in the current uh, processors, the memory system will consist of uh, CPU registers, which I have not included here, but CPU registers will be here somewhere. Sorry. But CPU registers generally are not uh, uh, assignment to CPU registers will be done by uh, operating system itself. So, OK, I've not included it here, but OK, we should have included it here. Anyhow, so if you look at the memory system, it will consist of the primary memory, which is your main memory and secondary memory, which is your hard disk memory. Uh, but there are other also uh, secondary storage uh, systems, which are uh, compact disks, uh, versatile disks, digital versatile disks, tape storage. And then nowadays, we have got removable media, which could be your pen drive, which could be your uh, external hard disk, etc. Now, if you look at this scenario, if you look at the cost, the cost will increase from, from uh, and uh, uh, speed and size, speed will also uh, increase from this to this. So cache would be the fastest. And that's why it is the costliest, most expensive. And uh, cache memory is uh, uh, residing between main memory and CPU. So generally, cache uh, is not used as uh, a, a cache is used as a buffer. So if CPU is accessing something very frequently, and if it is available in the cache, then it can increase the performance of your memory system, access time of your memory system. Uh, hard disk, but, but cache and main memory are volatile, and hard disk is non-volatile. Nowadays, we have also solid state devices, which will, which will be uh, coming somewhere here in terms of uh, access time. So these are uh, kind of flash memories, and which are actually very large flash memory. So they are a good replacement of hard disk in uh, systems which do not require too much memory. So most of the most of the laptops are coming with uh, solid state devices, which will be somewhere here. Now, uh, solid state device as uh, generally they are more popularly known as SSD. So now, if you look at your laptop specification, if you have purchased it recently, maybe one or two years back, so it will have some SSD also. 
So it actually supplements your hard disk. And uh, the idea is that it makes your laptop uh, less heavier and better. And now between this uh, CPU and this, there'll be also CPU registers. It's difficult to write with the pen. CPU register will also be volatile. Uh, I will have to check for solid state device. I think this is not uh, uh, volatile. But the problem with solid state device is that uh, life of a particular memory cell is decided by the number of times it is accessed. So if you are writing to one part of uh, SSD array quite frequently, then ultimately that part will become uh, bad. So the SSD management is slightly more complex and it tries to uh, ensure that all parts of the memory system are uh, accessed uniformly. So if a file is being returned to the SSD system and if you make some changes to the file, it might not be returned to the same area, it might be relocated to some other area to ensure that all areas of memory get uniform number of reads and writes. So that is the problem with solid state devices. And as a result, if you're removing a file, the file may not be completely deleted from SSD because it might not delete the file to avoid access. So this could be a security problem. So if you look at uh, new laptops, uh, sometimes they say that, uh, if, especially if you have Mac, Mac will say that uh, uh, it cannot securely delete the file because it is using SSD. Anyhow. But the one thing that we need to remember is that unless the data is in the main memory, CPU cannot access it. Once the data is in the main memory, some of the data may be cached into the cache, and CPU will try to access the data from cache as well as main memory. But if it is received from the cache, the query from the uh, it will not try to access it from the main memory. So if it is not available in the cache, then only it will try to access it from the main memory. So if data is being frequently accessed and it is available in the mem available in the cache, the access time can be reduced quite a lot. You have done it in the computer architecture, so I'm quite sure you're aware of this. Okay. So whatever the memory management system is, it should support transparency. Means as far as user is concerned, he's writing to the main memory and reading from the main memory. He is not aware that data is being cached or data is being stored into the hard disk. The user is not aware of these details and how this is being done, how often, how frequently the data is being stored into the swap area of the disk, or whether it is stored into the hard disk, or whether it is being stored, uh, loaded from the hard disk. The user is not aware of this. So the system is, as far as system is concerned, a big memory is available for him to use. Then memory, through the data is being shifted from hard disk to main memory to cache or vice versa. Uh, as far as user is concerned, he should get an illusion that this is being done almost in real time. So it should be done in time efficient manner and memory should not be wasted and it should be space efficient also. So to manage that operating system has to keep track of which parts of the memory are in use, which parts of the memory are free and these two data structures have to be managed in such a manner that whenever a request for memory allocation comes, the area from the free space memory can be made available at the earliest. And whenever a process does not re require some part of the memory, it should be deallocated from that memory and maybe and, and should be shifted back to free space data structure. Uh, at the same time, operating system should ensure that there is a protection, there is a security, and one process cannot access the memory allocated to another uh, process. And there should be isolation between the memory regions allocated to different processes. But at the same time, there are some processes which require to share the memory. For example, if you are using a, a, any a taxi, radio taxi app, uh, then that app needs to access data from maps. So naturally maps and taxi app, they both are sharing some common data. So uh, memory management should allow facilitation of shared memory and uh, in a way that does not create any race conditions. 
or unnecessary overrides or uh, uh, resulting into any security hazard. So now, if the memory has to be divided between different processes, one of the easiest ways is to divide the memory into different parts and allocate each part to different process. So this is known as space sharing. Long back when the uh, early operating system and when, when the operating system were just uh, coming up, uh, traditionally or uh, operating system occupies lower memory address starting from zero onwards. So now in this particular case, the generally the way it is shown in the memory diagram, especially when we are going to discuss stack overflow, uh, the the lower addresses are shown at the bottom. So the addresses are increasing from this direction to this direction. So addresses are increasing from this direction to this direction. And the rest of the memory could be used for user system. So naturally, this, uh, uh, as far as user program is concerned, a single contiguous block of memory is available to be used. Now, the main problem in this particular scenario is how do you ensure that it will support multi-programming, that more than one, one program can, 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 can coexist within this uh, system? And naturally, operating system is also uh, evolving uh, software. So different versions of operating system will be uh, released. So naturally, operating system may require more than 4 megabyte of the memory. So how do you accommodate that? That are the main issues in this particular scenario. OK. So one thing is, OK, you are using one partition, which is meant for uh, user, single user partition. And uh, one of the way to ensure that the same partition can be shared across different processes could be that you load one process, run it for some time, then save it to hard disk, then load another process into the memory, run it for some time, then uh, send it back to hard disk, and continue this cycle. The problem in this particular case is that loading data from secondary memory to primary memory and saving it back would require a lot of time. So this particular implementation is not time efficient. But the, of course, every process will feel that the, in fact, every process is being given the uh, complete available memory uh, to, 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 to that process. So every, so, so of course, memory virtualization is there, but the problem would be time. So another problem would be that, uh, if you are assuming that operating system is also always occupying the addresses from 0 MB to 4 MB, then user program can start from 4 MB onwards. So a compiler can start uh, uh, allocating addresses to the user program starting from 4 MB. But uh, the problem is that operating system itself can grow because of the change in OS version. So different utilities, different functions may be added, or some of the functions may be modified. There could be new addition of new device drivers, or some of the existing device drivers can be updated. So, so naturally, operating system can also grow. So naturally, if the operating system grows, let's say, to 5 MB, then user program cannot be loaded into this part. User program cannot be loaded into this part. And uh, it has to be relocated from 5 MB onwards. So all the programs which were compiled with 4 MB option will not run because they cannot be loaded into the memory and cannot be run. So how do you solve it? So you solve it by using space partition. So one of the way to solve it would be using relocation. So actually, each pro program will be uh, will be uh, compiled as if it is being loaded from address 0. And now if it has to be relocated to 5 MB, then all the addresses, which are absolute addresses, will be added by 5 MB. So 0 MB will, 0 will transfer, transfer to 5 MB, 1 MB will become 6 MB, 2 MB will become 7 MB, and so on, so forth. Now what I said was absolute addresses. 
but there could be some relative addresses also. What we mean by relative address? Something like jump plus 23, jump minus 5. So these addresses are relative to the current address. So naturally, the compiler has to ensure that relative addresses do not go any translation. And all other address sensitive uh, addresses should be relocated. So naturally, a, a compiler has to mark which of the addresses are address sensitive and which of the addresses are relative and need not be relocated. And when the program is loaded by the loader, it will ensure that relocation is done properly. Now, once if we are doing the relocation, so naturally I can use, I, I can relocate one program to let's say 10 MB and I can relocate another program, pro, program to let's say 25 MB. So these two programs can exist in different parts of the memory. So why not use this as a solution to support multi-programming? So this relocation will, will, will ensure that if I divide my pro, uh, memory into multiple partitions and relocate different programs, to different partitions, then it will support multiprogramming. And at the same time, if operating system is growing, then relocation also allows me to uh, locate user program to different partitions, and it will support operating system growth also. So relocation will solve both of these problems. So let's go for multiple partitions. So naturally, uh, some of the partitions will be reserved for operating system, and other partitions will be reserved for other processes. Generally, now partition may be of same size or they may be of different size. So uh, that way it, it is fixed size partitions or variable size partitions. And uh, memory virtualization is being achieved through space sharing where the complete memory address space is divided into different partitions. Any questions? And I hope you have answered the attendance question. Any questions? So from now onwards, except for Monday, all other classes will be from 9 o'clock. So on Monday, we'll be meeting at 10 o'clock. Any questions? Any questions? OK, thank you. Now, uh, naturally, the maximum number of processes that can be allocated will be equal to the number of partitions. Now, when I'm talking about the number of partitions, I'm assuming that uh, only the partitions which are which are available for user processes. So the partitions which have been allocated to operating systems are not being counted here, okay? So it is equal to the number of partitions which are available for user processes. Now, but the, now the question comes, what should be the size of the partition? If the size of the partition is too small, then except for where processes, other pieces cannot be loaded into the memory and cannot be executed. If it is too large, then uh, let's say if the partition size is 10 MB, and if most of the processes are 5 MB, 7 MB, or 2 MB, then the rest of the partition would be wasted. It will lead to internal fragmentation. So, so that is what the problem would be. So if the, if the process is requiring only this much size, if a process requires only this much size, then this part is being wasted. So this is known as your internal fragmentation. So uh, that will be the problem. If the pro you keep the process size too small, then uh, partition size too small, the processes cannot be, cannot be executed. Uh, if the, when a process executes, then that partition becomes free. And uh, so ultimately, if you look at the memory, memory will look like some partitions which are allocated and some partitions which are available. So if process B leaves, then this partition will become available. 
So now the memory is fragmented. Some parts are in use and some parts are free. So here the this is show, shows the internal fragmentation. So green area shows the uh, memory space which is occupied by the process. So this process is occupying its com partition completely. This is a free partition. And now this partition is occupied by a memory, by a process which is not large enough to occupy the complete partition. So you can see that this part, part portion is a, is a fragmentation. This is fragmentation. And this is also fragmentation. So what can you say about the average size of uh, fragmentation area? So what is the average fragmentation size uh, Pradeep Pradeep can you tell me what will be the average fragmentation size Pradeep Rachid Gupta, why everyone is leaving the meeting? Vinu Shushunath, Moksh Ahuja. I think when all the people leave, then only I will take the screenshot and I'll use it as your attendance now. Because if you think you have answered the attendance question and uh, that is it, it's not done. So I'm not very keen on attendance. Tanmay, can you tell me what will be the average size? Uh, average fragmentation will be 50% of what? So it will be 50% of the, so it will be half the partition size. So whatever size of partition that you're keeping, it will be half the partition size. Uh, Divya, can you explain your answer? One third in the upper and two third in the lower total 50%. I'm not talking about this particular scenario. In general, the minimum fragmentation size would be one byte. So if you're uh, reserving, if your partition size is, let's say partition size is equal to n bytes. Okay, so the minimum fragmentation could be equal to one byte and maximum fragmentation could be, yes, anyone within how many bytes it would be? So maximum fragmentation will be n minus one. If it is n, then naturally it means uh, the partition is not at all uh, allocated. Okay, so it will be n minus one byte. So some of the processes will have one party, one byte uh, fragmentation. Some of them will be having n minus one byte. Some of them will have two bytes. Some of them will have n minus two byte. Some of them will have three bytes. Some of them will have n minus three byte. So if we assume that uh, the size of the processes are uniformly distributed, then on an average, the fragmentation would be n by two. And this is internal fragmentation. Why? Because the memory that is being wasted is part of the partition itself. Okay. Any questions till now? Ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, if a process exits, then the whole block is empty. Then in yeah. that case, can't we consider that uh, the fragmentation size is n bytes total? No, but if the whole block is empty, then this process, this this, this area can be allocated to another process. So this is not fragmented area. This is free space. It's shown here as a fragmented memory in the upper second, second from upper I've, I've shown it as unused memory space. 
Okay. I've not shown you that fragmented space. In fact, I should have used different color for fragmented space. That's what I realized it, but uh, right now I couldn't have changed it. So I'll change it in the slides that I, I, I will give you and add one more uh, row here. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Now, but there is another problem that we have not realized. Uh, we'll come to later on. So this is an example of a fragmentation. So let's say if the fixed partition size is 64 kilobyte and process has been allocated on 58 kilobyte. So out of 64 kilobyte, 58 kilobytes are in use and six kilobytes are being wasted. And uh, so, so that's what we actually discussed right now, that minimum fragmentation. This, this is what we discussed right now. Anyhow, any questions till now? This is the problem here. Okay, I have to see how to set it. So now the problem is that some of the processes may require two partitions. Uh, they may not be fit into one partition. So another solution that was proposed was known as variable size partitions. So here the partition sizes are variable. So a process is allocated as much memory as it is required, as it requires, provided that much partition, that much free space is available. So in this particular case, degree of multiprogramming at any instance will change. So quite possibly the complete area might be allocated to one process or it may be divided to two unequal or equal size partition and be given to two processes and so on. So the term that they were used for the free space was known as whole. And uh, the memory may become uh, fragmented because memory consists of allocated regions which are interspersed with holes. How? The, let's look at that. Let's look at this scenario. In this particular case, this is the uh, first case in which five processes are there, A, B, C, D, E, and B is running. And then B quits. When B quits, this part becomes available. Then C quits, then this part becomes available. Now operating system will manage free space and if two free, if two partitions which are uh, nearby become free, then it will merge them into a large partition. Uh, G enters, so process E quits and process G enters. Now, if you look at the memory, these two partitions, these two, there are two holes, one hole between D and G and one hole between A and D. Uh, now, the size of the hole is not uh, is determined by the size of the partition which was allocated to a memory, and so naturally, different processes are of different sizes. So, so the whole size will also keep on, keep on changing. Now this particular part, which is not allocated to the memory, is now outside of the process space. So this is known as external fragmentation. So at times, if let's say another process comes, and this occupies this much space, if a process occupies this much space, then this part is too small to allocate any other process. So this, this, this will ultimately be a kind of waste. So this is an external fragmentation. Similarly, if there are two processes which are coming, one here and another here. So this might be the wasted space. So after some time, small regions will start becoming appearing, uh, small holes. Some of the holes will become too small to accommodate uh, any, any process and they will, be, they will be wasting space. This is known as external fragmentation. So internal fragmentation is unutilized memory within the partition and external fragmentation is outside the partition. So now one thing that we need to remember was, okay, we talked about how the space will be shared, but how the isolation will be maintained to ensure that uh, hardware uh, provides support in the form of registers. They, at least it will require two registers. One is known as base register and another is known as limit register. We said that memory is increasing. If you remember completely, remember my earlier slide, that memory addresses are increasing in this direction. The smallest address is at the bottom and the largest address is at the top. So base register will tell you the, the, the smallest uh, memory address which has been allocated to this process. And limit will tell you the highest uh, address which is allocated to this process. Now limit can be expressed by two ways. Either it can be the highest address or it could be base plus X. So it could be the value of the X. So if the base address is starting from 5 MB, 
and uh, the highest address that can be allocated to that mem uh, that process is 7 MB. So either the limit register could be set to 7 MB or it could be set to the difference between the two that is 2 MB. Uh, have you understood my point? So, so the higher, higher, higher address could be either limit register or base plus limit. So it depends how the operating system, uh, how the hardware will be managing or how the operating, sorry, how the uh, operating system will be loading these registers. So either the uh, limit register could be the highest address which is allocated to the, to the, to the process or it could be the highest offset that could be allocated to the process. So limit register could be either the highest address or the highest offset. If it is the highest address, then any address which is allocated to the memory, allocated to a process, should be greater than or equal to base register, but less than or equal to limit register. It could be less than or less than equal to, depending upon again, what the limit register has been loaded with. So base register se bada hona chahiye address, but limit register se kam hona chahiye. But agar we are keeping limit as the highest offset, then the address should be greater than base, but less than base plus limit. So depending upon how this uh, limit register is uh, loaded with the op operating system, uh, address validation can be done by, by, by applying this check. Now when a new process, when the context which takes place and a new process comes, then this base register will be, let's say the process A comes. So base will be loaded with the base register of A and limit will be according. So limit base and limit registers will also be saved and restored at the context switch. Is that clear to everyone? So now because base and limit are uh, changed when the process A is loaded, then any address which is now generated by this process will be checked against these registers. And if it doesn't, if it fails the check, then segmentation fault occurs. Any cross proper, any, any question till now? Now, in case of variable size partition, because different size of partitions are available, different holes are available, which hole should be given, should be allocated to a process. So the strategy could be first fit, best fit, worst fit, or next fit. So for example, let's say we have got this scenario in which uh, the uh, uh, green, green portion shows a hole. So the size of hole is, let's say, 72 kilobyte, 34 kilobyte, 68 kilobyte, 24 kilobyte, 56 kilobyte, and 48 kilobyte. So there are six holes, 72, 34, 68, 24, 56, 48. So a hole is a space which is available. And let's say the processes are coming, and the size of the processes are 32, 68, 50, 20, and 40. So the strategy that we are going to discuss now would be first fit, best fit, worst fit, next fit for this example. So let's talk about first fit. Now first fit means it will start scanning the holes from, uh, from left to right, or we can say from bottom to top or top to bottom, depending upon uh, whether it is going from lower memory address to higher memory address or higher memory address to lower memory address. So operating system will keep one direction. So in first fit, the very first hole, which is large enough to accommodate the process, will be allocated to the process. In best fit, the operating system will try to ensure that wastage is as low as possible. So the idea is that uh, if you give the, uh, the hole which is uh, having the uh, nearest size to the process, then you might accommodate more processes. The worst fit uh, has another uh, concept you uh, give the uh, hole with the highest size. So the idea is that even after allocation of the process to a hole, the remaining memory will be sufficient to accommodate other processes. In case of best fit, once a pro process is allocated to the nearest uh, size hole, then the space available will be very, very small. So it will actually result in small holes which are distributed across the memory space and these small holes will not be able to accommodate other process. The next fit is like first fit, but actually if, if, if I was allocating the process and let's say I was at this particular scenario. Hole. So the pointer uh, is not advanced to the first location. 
it will be starting from the location which was allocated last and it will it will be incremented accordingly so that's the idea so let's take an example so these are the so if we come first fit the process one will be allocated to the very first hole the very first hole is the 72 so it gets allocated so 32 gets allocated and 40 kilobytes are free so the whole size has now shrunk to 40 kilobyte then the process six, second process comes so it will be allocated to this hole third process comes so the very first hole which can accommodate it will be 56 so it will be accommodated here then the next process comes which is 70 and we do not find any hole which can accommodate it so this process will not be accommodated p4 cannot be allocated then the next process that comes is 50 so sorry i i made a mistake here uh, it should have come to this this particular scenario okay so rather than okay so this should have come to this place and not this place so this this is where it is wrong so actually sorry i let me correct it here so this should have been p5 and this should have remained the free space in case of best fit, we are going to allocate it to the nearest size hole. So 32 ka nearest is 34. So it will be allocated here. So you can see this hole size is too small to accommodate any other process. Then 68 will be allocated here. Then 50 will be allocated here. Then 70 will be allocated here. And 40 will be allocated here. So this is how the situation will look. But now you can see that these small holes are the will remain unusable because uh, you, it is very unlikely that you will find a process of that small size so the, these are the internal uh, external fragmentation worst fit 32 will go to the largest hole which is 72 then 68 will go to the largest hole now it is 68 itself 50 will go to the largest hole uh, 70 cannot be allocated 40 will go to the largest hole so this is how the worst fit scenario should look like. Let's go to the next fit. So right now the pointer, this, this shows the pointer. Pointer is at 72. So the first process comes, gets allocated. So pointer will get advanced. Uh, 68, the pointer is at this point. 50, then 70. 70 cannot be allocated. And 40, this will be allocated. So, so this will be the situation in the next fit. So in case of uh, uh, dynamic memory allocation, that as experienced in uh, variable size partitioning, after years, small hole will start becoming start 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 appearing in the system, and these may not be useful. So individual hole may not be useful, but but if we combine all these three, then maybe we can allocate a process here. So after some time, the operating system will ap apply memory compaction. So in memory compaction, the processes will be shifted. So process B gets shifted here. So all the processes get shifted. So all these three spaces now become a larger space which can accommodate one more process. But memory compaction is a time consuming process because it, it will require shifting a process are copying the bytes from one region of memory to another region of memory so you are copying almost entire memory so it will be it will be too complex too, too, too time consuming uh, now most of you might have heard of disk fragmentation and hard disk we are talking about hard disk now if you look at hard disk hard disk is also uh, using variables variable size partitioning because your files are of variable sizes and these variable size partitionings are uh, basically if you look at the way hard disk allocates memory uh, hard disk consists of blocks. A block is a collection of fixed number of sectors. So let's say a block is equal to eight sectors. And let's say each sector is two fifty six bytes. So each block will be equal to two fifty six into eight. That will be that will be two kilobyte. So, so file will be allocated to different blocks. So if a file is of 11 kilobyte, then it will require six blocks 
but one kilobyte will be wasted. This is your internal fragmentation. But ultimately, when you delete a file, some blocks will become free. So if you look at the disk, uh, some of the uh, contiguous areas will be allocated to a file, and then there will be some contiguous areas of free blocks, and then again some blocks which are allocated. So your, your, your hard disk, if you look at it as a contiguous uh, memory location array, then it will consist of some holes. And after some time, uh, these holes will, will become, uh, I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if you store a file into that, uh, they will be too small. And uh, the file will be scattered all over the uh, disk. So one block of the file is, uh, let's say, at address 1,000, another could be at 5,000, and another could be 10,000, and so on, so forth. So when you try to access this file, your uh, head will be moving quite a lot, and it will take a lot of time. So to avoid this, uh, at times, uh, your operating system provides a utility called disk defragmentation. Have you heard of this term? D fragmentation. So the idea is that you go for compaction so that all small fragments, they get compacted to one place into a large fragment. So this is known as defragmentation. Have you heard of this term? This is quite, uh, so you will find that on your operating system, there will be a facility for defragmentation of the hard disk. So initially, in the early years, the same defragmentation technique was, allow was, was allowed for uh, main memory management. Any questions? So try to find out what uh, commands are used for defragmentation in, in your operating system. Then you will also find the I think uh, I always make a mistake in the spelling of Gaussian, so D Gauss. Uh, basically, another thing is that because of the, you, you also try to demagnetize the hard disk. So this is known as degaussing. So you try to uh, search these terms and try to find out what do they mean. I'll come back to. So now, through the uh, through the uh, variable size partitioning was a solution, but the problem with these two scenario was that in in the in the beginning of. Uh, operating systems earlier days, the entire process had to be brought into the memory. So already the memory size was small, and if you divide it into different partition, then the, then, the, then, the, then the process size that could be accommodated into the memory will become even smaller. So to overcome this, uh, people realized that most of the programs are sequential in nature. Uh, only 20% of the instructions are related to branching that is jump, jump on zero or jump on some condition, even less than 20%. So most of the time, the, 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 the program is running in a sequential mode that you execute one instruction and then you execute the next instruction. So if one instruction is being executed, the, 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 the most likely the next instruction that will be executed would be the instruction which is next to it. So uh, most of the programs, they follow what we call uh, locality of reference. So, so the reference that is being used next will be the next reference. And they follow spatial locality as well as spatial locality or as well as temporal locality. It means uh, if you look from the space point of view, the instruction that is going to be accessed will be the instruction that is next stored in the next memory location. And uh, if you look from the time perspective, then uh, the next instruction is the one which is likely to be executed next in time. So because of that, do we need to bring the entire program into the memory? No, we can bring, let's say, 100 instructions of the program into the memory. And when the 100th instruction executes, then we can bring the next 100, and so on and so forth. So, so, so we need not bring the entire program into the memory. 
but now we have to keep track of which part of the program has executed and which program which part of the program needs to be executed next so what has been executed what has not been executed and there might be some jump instruction there might be some loop instructions so we may have to reload some of the part which have been executed earlier and execute it again so to and facilitate that so one thing that we know is that we need not bring the entire process into the memory we can bring part of the process into the memory run it and then bring the next part and then run it and so on so forth so the compilers they started so 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 the concept of virtual address space of the process comes now if you look at a process a process is uh, not only the code but also heap and stack that are required to ensure that this code can be run uh, correctly and uh, this the function calls can be uh, invoked and uh, memory can be allocated dynamically so we are using stack to ensure that function calls calls can be implemented correctly and we are using heap to ensure that uh, that memory can be allocated at run time so 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 this uh, text heap and stack that will make your process address space so process can be visualized can 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 be abstracted as address uh, memory allocated to code as well as heap as well as stack so now if you look at the heap some of the global variables they are also allocated on the heap and global variables may or may not be initialized depending upon your language so c language will always uh, initialize global variables but some of the processes may not uh, some of the languages may allow uninitialized data also at the at, 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 at for the global variable so this portion is for the global variables which have been specified at the compile time and this part of the heap will be used for malloc and c alloc and other runtime allocation system calls if you look at the stack the some of the uh, if you if you if you remember recall your c program in main we can we can pass arguments and these arguments will come from user input at invoking the program so you so 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 these are known as command line argument if they so if there are any command line arguments they will be pushed onto the stack so this is as if the operating system is calling the function and passing these arguments so this is how the virtual address space of a process will look like and always the smallest address that will be allocated will be zero the largest address that is allocated will depend upon the upon the process size or the virtual okay now generally uh, the size of the stack and the size of the heap that is available to a process is fixed by operating system you can change those limits uh, by by giving appropriate commands to the compiler but generally if you don't give any 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 input then the default size of the stack and heap is fixed you can change it but otherwise it is fixed if you don't give it anything it will be default size so naturally the compiler knows what will be the gen generated code compiler knows what will be the heap area compiler knows what is the stack area so the compiler knows what is the complete address space required by a process now the next question that you need to explore today is i'll be stopping at this place we'll be starting from here in the next class but when we when this process gets mapped to the memory okay there will be also a kernel stack associated with the process and uh, and uh, an operating system will create a process control block for this particular process so there will be other overhead structures which are created by operating system to manage the file this process control block as we have discussed in the lectures in processes this will contain information about the process the id of the process permissions of the process who is the owner of the process when was this process created and are there any children of the process what are the resources which are allocated to the process uh, any file uh, the resources could be your uh, uh, socket addresses it could be your file descriptors it could be uh, locks which are required by the process etc and this process control block will also keep information about the the cpu usage time it will also have uh, so so it will contain information pertain so what are the blocks uh, what are the uh, uh, memory 
regions which are allocated to this mem this, this process, etc. So this will keep a lot of information. Okay. So, so we'll be starting from here and we'll see how this virtual address space uh, is managed through paging as well as segmentation. Okay. In the previous uh, scenario, so I'll stop at this point. I'll share these slides with you, and I'll ask you to go through these slides, and we'll start from here in the next class. If there are any questions, you can ask me right now. Uh, otherwise, I would like you to also explore about what was the question I wanted to wanted you to find out. Yeah. Stack size and heap size. So you have to find out what are the default stack size and heap size and how to change it in your operating system, whatever operating system you're having. So I want you to find out the questions of these four things. Uh, I'm just posing it on the, uh, so this will be the part of the assignment along with the assignment that is, that is, that is, that is there here in the slides. There was one assignment I gave you. Yeah, this memory compaction assignment. Let me change its color so that I know that this is an assignment. And I will also give you one assignment uh, on uh, uh, first fit to next fit. And along with these two, these two questions. So I'll be adding these to the slides and I'll be sharing with you. So you need to do to these, these assignments. If there is any question, then you can ask me. And uh, we'll start from here in the next class. Any questions? Okay, so uh, you need to attend the next class. So I'll be stopping the session now and uh, we'll meet again tomorrow at nine o'clock. So I'll stop sharing now. See you tomorrow.